Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this whole video we are, well, uh, we're talking about a few things, as we usually do. One, we're talking about a guy named Matthew Hoffman. Two, his obsession with trees. And then three, his house of leaves. It's as weird as it sounds. So in this video I'm going to be talking about tree, and also trees, and it's going to be a lot of fun because you're not going to know which. I feel like we should just use this video as a cleanse. Just get it out of our system, okay? But first, we gotta get in. This story is very bizarre. I mean, come on, it's set in Ohio. It starts with a shocking disappearance, followed by a shocking discovery. So let's give it a go. This story takes us in and around the small city of Mount Vernon, Ohio. City motto, one of Ohio's most likable communities. Which is oddly self-deprecating. We're not even the most likable, you know, just kinda likable. I dig it. It is host to almost 17,000 people, and it's an hour northeast of state capital Columbus. Not a whole lot you can find there you can't find elsewhere, other than this story. There's a lot of parks, greens, and a low crime rate. Which means though that, you know, when a crime does occur, judging from the stories I've told, that crime is gonna be weird as shit, and you bet your ass. It's a perfectly fine, unremarkable, small town in the Midwest. This story is anything but, uh, beginning on the 10th of November 2010. The weather around that time of the year is crisp. The last of the autumn leaves are still hanging on for dear life before being swept away by the winter winds and cold ass snow. It was near Mount Vernon that Tina Rose Herman lived. 32 years old, single mother, she lived with her two children. Outgoing and happy-go-lucky Sarah Maynard, 13 years old, and shy, quiet Cody Maynard, 10 years old. Her two children were fathered by Larry, but Larry and Tina could never make it work. And so the children lived with their mother at 481 King Beach Drive. At the time she was actually dating a guy named Greg, but that relationship was, was on the rocks and looked to be soon sundered. Now, they lived in the Mount Vernon suburb of Howard, less than a 20 minute drive away, near the banks of the Apple Valley Lake. They weren't planning on living there much longer. Tina, she wanted an apartment closer to work, but it would do just fine and dandy for now. Tina, she worked at the Dairy Queen in Mount Vernon. She'd been working there for years, and uh, she was due to... <laughs> it's that old cliche of, it started like any other day. It's that cliche, on the 10th of November, she was due to start her shift at about 4 p.m. It wasn't like any other day, and she didn't. Tina Herman, you know when she was supposed to be in work later on that afternoon? Well, she never showed up. She would usually go to work not long after her children came home from school. The manager at the Dairy Queen, unable to contact the reliable Tina, called 911 to do a welfare check that day. Did not show up for work this afternoon at four o'clock. Okay. You know, which is totally uncharacteristic of her. I'm very concerned about her. What, what's her name? Her name is Tina Herman. So the police rocked up to the house on King Beach Drive at about 7 30 p.m. Knocked on the door. No answer and no lights, so they presumed nobody home. And so the police left, you know, assuming they'd probably gone out of town, just. We're off somewhere. Whatever. The very next day though, uh, Thursday, now the 11th of November, another woman was reported missing. Odd, you know, in a place here where this, this kind of shit, people don't go missing around here. But what was even odder was that this was Tina's neighbor and good friend, Stephanie Sprang. Stephanie was 41 years old, had three children, and was a native of Mount Vernon. And she was last known to be popping into Tina's the day before. See, Tina was planning on moving, and Stephanie was helping her find a place. Tina's children, Sarah and Cody, they had also missed school on Thursday. 
So then what happened that Wednesday? Tina's manager from Dairy Queen, who had originally reported the disappearance, she went back. She decided to visit Tina's house herself and she let herself in and then she called the police again. I called in last night about Tina Herman being missing. Mm -hmm. I am out of her house now. There is blood everywhere. It was not pretty. Whatever happened, happened right inside the door, and it had been bad. Following the trail, the bodies had been dragged then into the bedrooms, and, uh, well, a lot more blood. But despite all this, no bodies were found in the house or outside. Wherever they went, they went elsewhere. The bathtub also was, was covered in blood and had been used for, uh, well, what you see in The Sopranos they used the bathtub for. So, four people missing, two women, two children, and a very gruesome scene left behind. Some clearly must have been just butchered, and perhaps others kidnapped. As to clues in the house about what could have happened, well, some of the stains were right by the door, so as soon as whoever came in, they were attacked. Groceries were in the kitchen, but not put away. Again, we can assume that they were attacked not long after entering. We can probably say those were left by Tina, and the receipt showed they had been bought around 12 p.m. So Tina, that morning, she'd been out and about, you know, doing some errands, and came home with a few bits and bobs, brought the bags into the kitchen, and before she could put them away, she was attacked. Then Stephanie, she was due to pop over then early that afternoon, and so we can assume due to the due to the scene. Uh, she came over to help her friend, and instead, there was someone there. And then the two children came home from school. Another clue was that the garage door was, was off, so perhaps someone entered via that. In the garage was more blood, and Tina's truck was missing. The killer may have put everyone in her vehicle, and off they went. But at least they knew they were searching for something, and they had something in particular, so... You know, the usual bolo, be on the lookout, went out. Finally, the last clue was a Walmart bag. It had tarps in it. You know, like, tools! No receipt, but you don't necessarily need one to track down where and when it was purchased and get CCTV. The police did their due diligence. Neighbors questioned if they saw anything. Her, her soon-to-be ex-boyfriend interviewed. Nada. Greg, who would be, you know, the most likely suspect, he also uh, just, you know, so happened to be out of the house when this all happened. But his alibis checked out. He was in work. No chance he hadn't been. On Thursday, Tina's car, it was found, discovered seven miles from her home on a lonely road. No bodies were inside. In fact, it was in comparison to the house remarkably clean. So then, due to that, the police suspected that there must have been a second vehicle that they were transported to. The Walmart items were tracked down, they dogged them, and those items had been purchased around Wednesday night, Thursday morning, at the local store. This gave them footage of the purchaser, and it was just a dude, regular bloke, scary shit. Like he was very chill about buying this shit. Sure will I buy this? Ah yeah, go on, be a fool, not that. From the footage, they could see his car. Didn't get a plate, but it was a Toyota Yaris. And so they, they well went from A to Z on all Toyota Yaris's in Knox County and an image of who owned them. Then comparing that, you know, with the guy in the CCTV footage, it led them to this. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. The boyo's name was Matt Hoffman. Sorry, Matthew Hoffman. A quick search of any history was done and dug up. Matthew was 30 years old, a local. His parents had a house on Apple Valley Lake. He had spent time in prison, six years in Colorado in 2001 for arson and burglary. Seems this guy had sticky little fingers and was a bit of a firebug too. He had a history of burglaries. Notably, as he worked as a handyman, he could gain access to houses pretty easily. In 2000, when he was 20 years old, in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, he robbed a house, set it on fire to cover up the robbery as he was worried his fingerprints would be detected, and then drove off in a stolen car. 
The fire spread and destroyed multiple houses, causing over $2 million in damages. He now lived in Ohio, working as a tree trimmer. He was a, an odd man. His favorite meal was the squirrels he found in his garden. He was well known as the local weirdo. He had been dating a woman, but that ended in uh, 2010. Uh, he eventually lost his job too as a tree trimmer due to being just kind of unreliable. And well, for old Matthew Hoffman, reality, it kind of became a distant memory. Unfortunately for everyone else, this was very real. On Monday the 15th, the police got a search warrant for his home at 49 Columbus Road in Mount Vernon. When I say search warrant, I mean SWAT kicked in the friggin' door. A door to a house of horrors. They struck at dawn and were first greeted by... Leaves, of all things. Leaves inside the house, bags upon bags of leaves, leaves covering the floor, feet high. And Matthew, sitting on his couch, slack-jawed. He was booked immediately, and the house of leaves was searched. The leaves were so thick, anything could be underneath them. Searching the house, the upstairs, they found nothing, no sign of the missing four. Until they got to the basement, that is. More leaves, more bags, and on a bed, a bed made of leaves, they found 13-year-old Sarah Maynard. She was okay, she was alive and relatively unharmed. None of the others, though, were found. The leaves were weird as shit and spooky, but not as frightening as what happened on the 10th of November. That morning, he snuck into the Herman home while everyone was out. He was likely watching it for, for some time. It was remote enough. In fact, this story, uh, it has a lot of similarities to, to uh, the Jamie Kloss case in that I think Matthew, I think Sarah may have been his target. Everyone else was kind of just in the way. So he entered the house via the garage door, and when Tina came home from grocery shopping, she was attacked. Then Stephanie came over and she too was attacked as she entered the house where a still waiting Matthew lay. The family dog, a small little thing, uh, that was in the house too, and he killed the dog too. Then that afternoon the kids entered the house, not knowing, not aware that a crazy psychopath was waiting for them. As soon as they entered, he sprinted at them. Cody was attacked, and Sarah managed to run to her room. He kicked down the door and tied her up and blindfolded her. He then drove and switched cars and came home. He handcuffed Sarah to a pipe in the basement, only giving her cereal with rotten milk. This all uh, came from Sarah in the hospital. Matthew, he was not uh, in a too much of a conversational mood. He didn't really say word one. Hey Matt. Matt. Roger Brown, I'm a detective here at the Sheriff's Office. Okay. Okay, you wanna take your hat and stuff off? Coat? All right with you. If I take them cuffs off and put them in the front, is that gonna be a problem? Okay, all right, let's do that then. All right, Matt, go ahead and stand up here for me. Alright, you just have to turn around here and just face the wall for me. Okay. Do you kind of understand what's going on here, Matt? That's it. We can explain all this to you if you want to talk to me, okay? I think you know what, we're, what we want to talk about. But we need to find some, find some people. Matt, can you hear me? The only reason that I don't know where Tina, Stephanie, and Cody are is because we had to spend a lot of time at the scene. Okay? 
We will know. We will find them. And if it's going to come to it that it's not with your help, then so be it. But I'm going to be the first guy to tell the jury that. I guarantee you. That I sat in an interview room with this guy. And all he wanted to do is close his eyes and blink him. Until I walk out of the room. And then he opens his eyes and gets his drink of water. Now. Am I a prudent person? What kind of person do I think that is? Well. One of two things. Either you're getting your, getting your composure together. You're thinking things out. Thinking what to tell us. Or. You don't give a shit about anybody. There's about 12 hours of it, and he says absolutely nothing. He does, however, sign something. You know, other people, there's family members out there of other people, and they all they want is closure. That's all they want. They've been up for days like you and I have, you know? Heart hurts. I don't understand sign language, man. Is that your heart? You're saying heart? Broken. Your heart's broken? Because of what happened? No. Someone broke your heart? And they had no idea where Tina, Stephanie, and Cody were. He wouldn't say anything. In fact, until the prosecutors said, we will remove the death penalty if you tell us where Tina, Stephanie, and Cody are, well, he agreed. Agreed on condition that the police shoot him in a faked escape attempt. Here lads, would you mind just killing me and then say I tried to make a run for it? The only thing the police shot was that down. They said, uh, how about no? He stopped talking for about two more days until he finally relented. Matthew would claim that it was a burglary gone wrong, you know, that old one, and that he never meant to kill anyone. He just did, horrifically, as an accident. He tripped, fell, and somehow butchered them. He'd just been there to rob the house. He said that he'd been in the house and Tina came home, and he was surprised. So he tried to knock her out with a, with a blackjack he had. He hit her and hit her and hit her. She wasn't getting knocked out, he failed, and then panicked when Stephanie came home. So he killed them both. And then the kids uh, came home and the whole situation kind of escalated and escalated into what happened. He said. Dendrophilia uh, is a sexual condition, I guess, uh, where you get hard for trees. Literally, it means love of trees. Yeah, you find them hot, dude. Smoke shows. Bang that bark, get your roots in the roots. Make like a tree and make out with a tree. That was Matthew Hoffman. Hence the leaves in his house. They were everywhere and it would have taken some time to get him. Some time I'm sure he enjoyed. Neighbors said they saw him climbing the trees in his garden all the time, having some crack. And so, when he finally told the police where the bodies were, it made sense. But it was still as surprising as it was horrifying. The Cuckasing Wildlife Area lies about 15 minutes north of Mount Vernon. It's a little place for camping, fishing, and hunting some smaller game. And lots and lots of trees. Matthew directed them to one in particular, a hollowed out tree. Inside that 60 foot tall tree were the tree bodies. They had been dismembered and stuffed inside. The tree was hollowed to a point, uh, and, and how he did it is speculation because we found the location, we took them out with uh, Part of the reason we took them out that we did the way that we did and we cut the part of the tree away is uh, our priority to not only to recover them, but to recover them with sensitivity and with dignity uh, for the victims and for the victims' families.
Matthew Hoffman pleaded guilty to the 10 counts against him, including aggravated murder, sexual assault, kidnapping, and gross abuse of a corpse. At this time, as I understand it, Mr. Hoffman is prepared to enter a plea of guilty to all counts. And Mr. Hoffman, do you understand everything that's been said here today? Yes. It's been indicated to me that you desire at this time to enter a guilty plea to counts one and counts two of the indictment, charges of aggravated murder and unclassified felony. Is that a correct statement? Yes. It's also been indicated to me that you desire to enter a guilty plea. Yes. Yes. And is Mr. Hoffman has asked me to make a brief statement. That is simply, the family deserves to know this was a random burglar that went terribly, terribly wrong. No one person, no family was singled out. It's tragic. You can't undo what is done. And was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. He told the police that when he had kidnapped Sarah, they played video games and watched movies together. Didn't look like it when they found her. And he didn't have a great time in prison either. I asked about how her son is adjusting to prison life. She said he's had some difficulty, experiences mild forms of panic attacks, and to this day has never spoken a word about the murders. Hoffman has been serving time at the Allen Oakwood Correctional Facility in Lima for the last 11 months. 10TV was granted access to his records. In March of 2011, he broke a glass shelf and was charged with disobedience, destroying property, and creating a disturbance, resulting in seven days segregation. He's also had minor conduct reports for being out of place, a visiting violation, and refusing an educational test. Hoffman remains in protective custody, requires close supervision, and is considered a level three inmate. Insane story. Very disturbing. Matthew Hoffman was obsessed with leaves, obsessed with trees, and ultimately obsessed with murder and death. His house, uh, come on, an absolute madman. He scribbled on the walls, just did lots of weird shit, there was leaves everywhere. In his freezer, only popsicles and dead squirrels. This guy is like something out of a movie or TV show, like come on, seriously, how is this real life? He's like, like, like one of the villains in Hannibal. But thankfully Sarah was saved. Tragic by the others. Scary, uh, story. At least... Matthew is where he belongs, behind bars. Good luck finding trees there, dickhead. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate taking the time to, you know, get to the end of the video and watch it, and I hope it, you found it interesting and all that scale uh, right here. Go on, I'll see you as always real soon in the next one, you know it. Until then though, please, uh, really, take care of yourselves, because I love you. Oh my God.